Hi, hello. Yo Yurga here with the Wise Sleep with Mudita and Wise Habit podcast. I'm extremely pleased to be able to put together an episode for you about what's important when sleeping, what's essential for sleep, and why do we sleep at all. We decided to base our collaboration with the Mudita and Wise Habit brand on education so that you know why certain things are worth doing. Why should we care about our sleep rituals? And why is it worth taking care of a good daily routine? I'll do my best to make this crystal clear for you today. First of all, we have to realize that sleep is one of the most important functions of our body. At the very moment we are born, first we have to take a breath. Then we need to sleep. A lot. Without sleep, we wouldn't physically exist. If we were to think about what is the cheapest form of torture, it is precisely sleep deprivation. On the second day without sleep, we behave as if we have 1.5 per mil of alcohol in our blood. So yes, you can be drunk without drinking. I point this out for the reason that we need to know how important the sleep function is in our daily routine. In fact, if it is not taken care of, we often find ourselves in a place where we simply do not deliver. We are not able to fulfill ourselves as partners, as parents, as people. We can't cope with reality. What does sleep affects? Sleep contributes primarily to our good mood, but this doesn't work like a charm. We won't be cheerful just because we've slept for seven, nine hours. Sleep is crucial to the functioning of our entire body. During sleep, we get rid of toxins. Our body cleanses itself. At night, hormonal functions are regulated. Also during sleep, we learn new things. Our brain remembers, transfers information from short-term to long-term memory. There are no areas of life that are not affected by sleep. If we are sleep deprived, we are nervous. Then we might make radical, ill-considered decisions. We are much more easily irritated. We also have a need to overeat. We look for high-calorie food. Very often it's fast food because we need to quickly recharge our brain. It needs sugar to make up for sleep deficits, which translates into diabetes in the long run. There are many consequences of not getting enough sleep. For men, a lack of good quality sleep can, for example, translate into impaired sperm quality and difficulties with having children. We might think that if we're pulling a night's sleep for a new project, for a report, for a TV series, or reading some great new book, we can basically sleep it off the next day. But this just isn't the case. We need to sleep regularly. Our brains and our bodies in general love regularity so that we can function healthily. Also to have good immunity. One of the components of high immunity is precisely sleep, during which our bodies have the time to recover. So first and foremost, as my students say, Let's not romanticize the sleepless nights. Let's just tell ourselves straight. Okay, it happened. Let's try not to repeat it. Because this sleep deprivation will affect every element of our functioning. Lack of sleep adversely affects all areas of our lives. And 67% of people in the world and 79% in Poland are aware of this. They know that the lack of sleep irreversibly affects health and well-being. However, as many as 55% of us sleep less than seven hours a night and 25% or one in four of us sleep less than six hours a night. Just to be clear, this is far too little. An adult needs an average of seven, five to nine hours of sleep per night. At the same time, I may need 7.5 hours, but my partner may need nine hours. That doesn't mean that he's a sleeper and I'm a workaholic. We inherit the amount of sleep needed genetically, and we owe its length to our parents. Of course, a different amount of sleep is required by young children, another by teenagers, and yet another amount of sleep is required by older people. The range of 7.5 to 9 hours applies to adults, somewhere between the ages of 25 and 65. It would be beneficial to us to get exactly the same amount of sleep every night, to go to bed at a similar time and get up alike, because broken nights cannot be slept off. Of course, if we sleep for five hours the whole week, we'll probably sleep for 12 or 16 hours on the weekend. But that won't make up for those gaps and deficits, nor undo the havoc that disturbed our brains during that week of sleep deprivation. So developing a healthy routine, learning rituals that allow us to release stress in the evening, sleep more deeply, wake up in a good mood. These are all extremely important elements of a holistic approach to life. So how can we check if we are sleeping long enough? 
if you aim to get that minimum of seven five hours of sleep per night, because that's the minimum for an adult, and most of us would likely sleep less in our lives rather than more, and the next day you have to get up at 7.30 in the morning, you should check into bed around 11.30 p.m. You'll still have some time to chill, to talk to significant other, to read a book, to do some breathing exercises. You'll hope to fall asleep around midnight and after two weeks of such regular routine, you should start waking up five minutes before your alarm clock, right around 7.30 a.m. Feeling fresh and rested, if after two weeks the new schedule still isn't working well enough for you, add another half an hour of sleep and see if it gets better. Are the eight hours optimum for you? And so on and so on. I know, it sounds terribly labor-intensive. And it takes time, but there is no magic spell for this stuff. No magic pill or diagnostic test that will undoubtedly say this individual needs precisely eight, five hours of sleep per night. We have to figure out for ourselves how much sleep our own body needs. But it is a very cool exercise where we can get to know our routine around sleep. Very often I hear that someone sleeps awfully long, but when they start keeping a sleep diary, which is one of the tools of the sleep package we do with Mudita and Wise Habit, it turns out that they actually sleep a lot less than they think. So figuring out how long and what quality your sleep is is super important. It is also worth paying attention to whether we dream things at night, because this also tells a lot about what's our overall condition. According to many different types of therapy, dreams are a way to communicate with the subconscious. We always dream what we have already seen in life, even if we don't remember it, and we can experience a full picture of emotions and experiences. So it's fun to write it down for ourselves. It's good to monitor it. The thing with dreams is that the moment you begin to write them down, even if at first it will be only some residual information, they seem to sharpen. Week by week, month by month, you will remember them better and better. It is also very useful to find out what kind of chronotype you are, whether you are the morning or the evening type. The chronotype translates into how our biological clock functions, at what times we perform better, when we should sleep, and when should we work. I promise I'll elaborate on this theme in episode two, dedicated to light. For now, let me just say that, according to the current classification, we have four chronotypes. These are lion, the equivalent of the former early bird or morning type, one that gets up on its own between five o'clock and 6.30 in the morning. After that, we have the most popular chronotype, which is the bear. These are the people who get up at around 7.30, like to sleep and need naps during the day. The Western world we live in today was crafted specifically for this chronotype. The next chronotype is wolf, the equivalent of former owls, those evening chronotypes of people who work best in the dead of the night. They go to bed very late or early in the morning and get up just as late. And there is also the atypical chronotype or dolphin, one who basically sleeps very short and very irregularly. They are the rarest of them all. You can check your own chronotype with the help of the book The Power of When by Dr. Michael Brose and how to adjust your daily schedule accordingly to your own needs. Note, we don't necessarily have to take all these steps that contribute to those rituals around sleep. We must design them for ourselves, develop routines that will serve us, but also won't require us to work very hard, instead will be a pleasure for us. The important thing is to make our very own set of habits for a good night's sleep. Before going to bed, it's extremely important to calm down, Put away the cell phone, turn off the screens that surround you. Don't spend the last hour before bed facing equipment that emits blue light. Try to do manual, analog things. Breathing and relaxation exercises work great here. Reading will do us good. Especially reading aloud is very oxygenating, so it will be easier to fall asleep afterwards. Simple physical exercises like stretching, playing with loved ones, talking with them, walking the dog, anything that causes our nervous tension to drop. The body can then oxygenate, and the mind is able to put closure to the events of the past day. Then, we are ready for sleep. Next, we should consider where and how we sleep. Do we have the right mattress for our weight, for our spine, and for our needs? Very important information. There are two zone mattresses available on the market. 
So if your partner is of completely different dimensions and weight than you, you can easily choose a mattress that serves both sides. Let's also remember that the useful lifespan of a mattress lasts for about 10 years. After a decade, all those fillers are already worn out enough to require replacement with a new one. And our body also changes over such a long period, so its needs may already be completely different. Let's not forget the fresh bedding matched to the season, warm flannel bedding for winter and, for example, linen slash hemp slash eucalyptus bedding for the summertime, which cools us down. We should also remember that the pillow should support our neck in such a way that we have a straight spine, so we choose pillows according to the position in which we spend most of the night. Let's focus on the lighting for just a bit. The light in the bedroom should be warm, ideally at the level of 2700 Kelvin. If you fancy reading in bed, you will also need a directional light. It will help with maintaining a good eyesight whilst reading a book, yet allowing the person next to us to sleep. These things are selected functionally. I promise to expand on the lighting subject. We have an entire episode considering the light coming soon. There are also solutions such as weighted quilts. Quilts that weigh 10 to 15% of the user's weight, usually filled with tiny glass marbles, that allow us to mechanically lower our muscle tension as we are pressed down. This is the kind of invention that was created for children on the autism spectrum, which adults have really come to appreciate. We already have a very large selection of such quilts on the market, so just remember, this is a personal object. My quilt, if I weigh 60 kilograms, will be a different quilt than the quilt of the person with whom I share a bed, who, for example, weighs 90 kilograms. These are things that need to be chosen individually. Also, remember that weight quilts do not heat, so we generally put it on top of the quilt we sleep under. In addition, we have various solutions around the recently very popular biohacking. I refer you to specialists in the field, but knowing your diurnal cycle, you are able to raise your organism's efficiency with the right supplementation. So if health is your priority, and it should be, there is a very interesting area of functional medicine as a whole to explore. Sleep is a superpower that we have for free. We don't have to pay dietitians, personal trainers, or therapists for it. It is something that we can take care of on our own and a foundation of developing healthy habits and healthy routines. Coming back to the sleeping area, let's remember that both, the bed and the bedroom, should serve us for three things. First, for good quality sleep. Second, for rest, relaxation with reading in bed, spending time together. And third, intimacy, for sex. It's insanely important that we feel safe in the bedroom, that we feel attractive, and that our bedroom supports us to get close with a loved one. The sense of touch is the most important human sense. Without it, we simply don't exist. So cuddling, closeness, sex, those experiences lower our nervous tension and allow us to function healthily. The bedroom and bed space must support us in such endeavors. Also, let's keep in mind that there are different sets of diseases that affect sleep. One of the most popular diseases is, of course, insomnia. In Poland, one in five people have sleep problems and 15% of us are diagnosed with insomnia. It shouldn't be left neglected. Let's seek help. Find help from specialists. As said before, sleep will translate into all other aspects of our lives and the correlation between insomnia and depression or anxiety is very close. Dealing with insomnia is pivotal to improve the quality of our well-being. There is also sleep apnea, sleep paralysis, there is sleepwalking. We have a whole set of derogations that can happen because, for example, a piece of our brain doesn't turn off or, on the contrary, it doesn't turn on at the right moment. That's the case with sleep paralysis. We are awake as consciousness, but our body continues to sleep. There can also be the case in which we are unaware of the fact that we stop breathing. We've just fallen into sleep apnea. These are things that should be consulted with specialists without question. There are a lot of devices on the market that are designed to help us monitor the quality of our sleep, our oxygenation levels, how we breathe. 
If you know you have any problems around sleep, it's worth using all these tools. Next, if we have children, regardless if they are very young or a little bigger already, it is worth taking care of their sleep habits as well. To teach them from the beginning that sleep is important and should take place at specific times. There's an everlasting debate about where kids should sleep, especially when they're super small. Should they sleep in bed with us or in their cribs in the parents' bedroom or alone in their very own room? This is, of course, a very individual issue, but let's just remember that a well-rested parent is also a well-rested child. So there comes a point when the little one excels at organizing space in the parent's bed and, even though being the smallest, takes up most of the space, in the meantime putting his elbows into the parent's ribs, heels into their livers and kidneys, that should be the point at which kids can already be evicted to their own beds. It's important to know what sleep habits are significant in the development of little human beings. When little people are born, they sleep for 20, then 18 hours a night. For the first half of the night, they dream vividly because they have so much information to encode that the brain processes information almost all night. At the MRI, we laugh that it looks like these brains are exploding because new neural connections are being formed in such numbers. We need to be aware that kids need to have a safe and supportive environment for this, so their sleeping habitat needs to be designed with their particular needs in mind. Indisputably, the most annoying time for parents is when their children become teenagers. During this period, the timing of the secretion of melatonin, the sleep hormone, in the body shifts roughly by two hours. So kids have trouble falling asleep and then they have trouble getting up. This was perfectly demonstrated in an American study when a high school shifted the time at which classes started by two hours. From 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., the quality of end-of-school test scores improved dramatically. How annoying it can be to wake up a teenager for school. Of course, if he or she has fallen asleep in front of a new computer game, then you can get rightfully pissed off. But the truth is that, to a large extent, it is biology that leads them to be so very difficult in the morning. Another challenge is our travels, specifically sleeping while traveling. This always breaks up our diurnal cycle and our habits. We are intensively sightseeing, experiencing, working late, having meetings in new places. We often change time zones, and going one way of the globe comes a little better, the other, worse. Someone wise once said that if we change several time zones, for example, we fly from the middle of Europe to New York, our body will be there within a few hours, but our soul and our head will arrive in three days. It takes roughly three days for our body to adjust to a new space and a new time zone. We need to be mindful of this, and we need to remember that, whether it's a vacation trip or a business trip, we need to try to cultivate our rituals, the good habits that we have. If we don't take good care of our homeostasis, the trip will be a very hard struggle for ourselves. To sum up these stories about sleep, I give you your 10 commandments for a good bedroom. Firstly, light. I promise to elaborate more on this topic, but what you need to remember is that, in the bedroom, we keep the light bulbs color warm. Make sure that the bedroom is cozy, pleasant, and that the light doesn't create a lot of contrast, so that it softens. The only stronger light is a spotlight for reading. Secondly, humidity. Many of us live in a climate in which we heat our homes for half a year. It very often results in very low humidity, which can drop to 18%. The correct humidity in living spaces is between 40 and 60%, so we should check what the humidity is in our homes, monitor it regularly, and, if necessary, introduce humidifiers into our environment. It could be a wet towel on the radiator. It could be ceramic dishes that have water in them. It could be electronic humidifiers. The only thing that's important is that the air's quality is high and it's humid. Thanks to that, we suddenly stop getting up in the night to drink. Our throats don't get dry. We don't wake up dehydrated. Humidity is one of the basic things in the bedroom that improves the quality of our sleep. Thirdly, temperature. The bedroom, second only to the garage and basement, should be the coolest space in our house. The temperature should be between 16 and 18 degrees Celsius or 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Right now, everybody cringes terribly, but hey, we do have warm quilts. We can put on pajamas. If we are still cold, let's put on socks. But let's make sure that our brain can regenerate in the bedroom. And it does it best in this temperature range. Next up, aromatherapy. If you like working with scents, the bedroom is an awesome space where you can experiment with sleep support through fragrance. For example, lavender oil helps a lot as it has a super calming effect and makes it easier to fall asleep. Eucalyptus, peppermint or pine oil are also worth checking out. Especially in winter, they help decongest the airways. Bring aromatherapy into your bedroom. Just remember to use essential oils from good suppliers because it's something we inhale, so it should be healthy and supportive for us. There's a lot more to it than just the scent. As with some spices, a substance identical to a natural is not a natural substance. It is important that we use chemical compounds that truly serve us. Another items, bedding, mattress, and pillow. If you don't know what position you spend the most of the night in, ask the person you sleep with. You could also prop your phone, since we've established it should be away from you anyways, and use your camera's hyperlapse function. We need to determine if you spend most of your sleep on your stomach, on your back, or on your side. All of these positions are fine, as long as our spine is straight and we don't smother ourselves with the pillow. Pay attention to how you are most comfortable, and whether the position you sleep in actually serves you. The only position that is not good for our body is the embryonic fetal position, when we are curled up in a ball. This generally indicates a lot of nervous tension, and in such a pose, our blood cannot reach the far ends of our limbs. Our hands freeze, our feet freeze, we are not able to warm up, and we are not able to oxygenate ourselves because our chest is closed. If you know that this is your go-to sleeping position for some time, you should necessarily ask yourself whether there is something happening in your life that is causing such strong nervous tension and whether you are able to counteract it somehow. Another rule is something very brutal that I said at the very beginning, which is zero screen time. Ideally, we should give up blue light emitters three to two hours before bedtime. But I know this is just my wishful thinking and that most of us don't have that option. A healthy minimum would be an hour before bedtime. We mustn't sleep with a lighted up phone by the bed. And as I mentioned before, the bedroom is a place for pleasure and for sleep. It is not a repository for miscellaneous things. So let's try to clean it up. Sweep under the bed, make it our base of peace and pleasure. Next up, acoustics. The topic of acoustics is something we often don't pay much attention to when designing spaces and choosing a place to live. We face it only when it inevitably turns out. For example, when we discover that we have a bus line directly under our windows, or we have very noisy neighbors. Fortunately, acoustic solutions that can help us achieve relative silence are plentiful. Firstly, carpets and curtains are very good at softening interior sounds and reducing room's reverb. Secondly, if you are facing renovation, the use of triple glazed windows can result in less outside ambient reaching you. Thirdly, there are already quite a few solutions of headphones and earplugs designed for sleeping, which allow us to find silence. The sonic distractor affects our nervous system intensely, even if consciously we no longer hear it because this sound is repetitive. Unconsciously, our cardiovascular system, our heart and our digestive system react very strongly to the noise. Pay attention to this. Whether the bedroom is quiet and whether you can do something to make it quieter. Another rule, order. I mentioned it a moment ago. Take out things you don't use in the bedroom. Look into all the nooks and crannies and make sure that the bedroom space is neat and clean. There will be less dust in it and as a result you'll sleep more pleasantly. Before the pandemic the bedroom was the space where we spent the most time. But we placed little value to it. After all we rarely invite anyone into the bedroom. It's the living room or the kitchen that are the representative spaces. In fact, the amount of time spent in a room should translate into how much thought and effort we put into arranging that environment. Last but most important, alarm clock. Dearly beloved, we return to alarm clocks as a separate object. We get rid of the phones from the bed. We do not charge them by the head, but choose solutions that do not disturb our sleep, do not glow blue, and offer us very pleasant sounds in terms of waking up. The Mudita Bell alarm clock, the first ever alarm clock by Mudita, is a wonderful analog solution whose design will remind you of your childhood days. It's nice to the touch, lovely designed, and the sound compositions were created for it by Nick Lewis. It's a fantastic story. 
because all these sounds are calm, they're pleasant, they make you wake up without informing your nervous system that you are in the middle of a battlefield. It allows us to calmly emerge from sleep and greet the new day. This is a basic mistake we often make. We wake up with very aggressive sounds. This alarm clock counteracts that and helps you wake up peacefully. In addition, although it has an analog dial, it also has a battery that allows it to recharge. So it's both a very pleasing to the ear and environmentally friendly experience. The second alarm clock, the more advanced one, that I would highly recommend to you is the Mudita Harmony alarm clock. And this is a very cool solution that allows us to develop healthy rituals. It offers us meditation and wise naps. We know from neuroscientists' research that the system of naps on a smartphone does us a lot of harm. Very often within those 10 minutes, we fall back into a deep sleep phase and then it's only harder to wake up. So Harmony offers us a completely different kind of naps, which allow us to close our eyes for a while longer, but certainly not to fall asleep so deeply anymore. It has a very soft light, which it can also use to wake us up, a solution very popular in Scandinavia. Waking up with light is advisable, considering how sensitive we are to light and how good it does us. Again, there is no lack of beautiful sounds. Here, not only Nick Lewis, but also Marcin Dimitar created sound compositions inspired also by nature. This device is more advanced, but still one that in no way overloads your nervous system and does not blind you with blue light. Instead, it supports healthy and valuable sleep. I'd like you to pick a few rules for a healthy bedroom and with small steps, after all, Rome wasn't built in an instant, step by step, start implementing these habits so that you sleep better because when we sleep better, we are definitely better versions of ourselves. On behalf of myself, the Mudita brand and Wise Habit, thank you very much. You can find Mudita alarm clocks and many other fantastic Mudita and Wise Habit products at the Wise Habit Concept Store at 24 Zelazna Street in Warsaw. I highly recommend a visit there. Let's catch up with the next episode this time about light. Take care of yourself. Yo, Jurga. Wise.